Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now without further ado, let's go. When I bought my first condo in a seemingly quiet neighborhood, I was young, ambitious, and eager to settle into my new home. Little did I know I was stepping into a minefield of pity politics and power-hungry individuals. From the moment I moved in, I noticed something was off. The homeowners association seemed to operate more like a dictatorship than a community organization. Rules were enforced selectively and there was always an air of secrecy around their decisions. At first, I tried to keep my head down and avoid conflict, but as a month went by, I couldn't ignore the blatant favoritism and misuse of funds. It started with small things. Board members, friends, getting away with violations that others were fined for. Mysterious special assignments that seemed to benefit only a select few. I'm not one to sit idly by when I see injustice, so I started asking questions. And that's when the real trouble began. The board saw me as a troublemaker, someone who wouldn't fall in line with their schemes. But they underestimated my determination. I spent countless nights poring over HOA bylaws, city regulations, and property laws. I attended every meeting, challenged every questionable decision, and slowly but surely I began to uncover the extent of their corruption. The breaking point came when I discovered a roof situation. The top floor residents had taken it upon themselves to claim the roof areas as their private property. One of them even built an entire sunroom up there. And now the board wanted all of us to foot the bill for the damage these unauthorized structures had caused. And that's when I knew I had to take action. I gathered evidence, rallied support from other homeowners and prepared for a showdown. The battle that ensued was nothing short of epic. I've uncovered some disturbing information about the roof situation. We need to address this at the next meeting. The board president says, that's not on the agenda. We will discuss it when we see fit. No, we will discuss it now. Every homeowner deserves to know what's happening with their property. The meeting that followed was heated, to say the least. I presented my findings, backed by irrefutable evidence. According to our deeds, no one has private rights to the roof areas. Yet, some residents have fenced off sections and even built structures without permits. Now you're asking all of us to pay for the damage they have caused. This is ridiculous. Those areas have always been for the top floor residents use. Show me where that's written in any official document. I'll wait. The silence that followed was deafening. I could see the realization dawning on the faces of other homeowners. The board was cornered and they knew it. Here is what's going to happen. Either you grant every homeowner full access to all roof areas or you limit the repair expenses to only those units who wrongfully claim the roof spaces. Karen, an entitled board member, you can't tell us what to do. Who do you think you are? I'm a homeowner who's tired of being taken advantage of, and I'm not alone. In the end, they had no choice but to comply. The illegal sunroom was reported to the city and had to be removed. It was a victory, but I knew the war was far from over. As the years went by, I continued to challenge their every move. It was exhausting, but I couldn't let them get away with their schemes. Finally, after what felt like a lifetime of battles, I decided it was time to move on. When I put my condo up for sale, I created a website to market it. That's when I had an idea. I bought not only the domain for my unit, but also for the entire building and the HOA itself. It was a small act of defiance, but it felt good. Month after I'd moved out, I received an email from the board president. We've noticed you own the domain names for our building and HOA. As you're no longer a resident, you need to turn them over to us immediately. I couldn't help but laugh at the audacity. I'm afraid that's not how it works. I legally purchased these domains. They are mine to do with as I please. This is unacceptable. Those domains belong to the property. If that's what your lawyers told you, you might want to find new representation. However, I'll be willing to sell the domains to the HOA. Fine. How much? Five thousand dollars. That's outrageous. Is it? That's the same amount you try to charge each homeowner for those unnecessary roof repairs. Consider it karmic justice. The stunned silence on the other end was priceless. I could almost hear the gears turning in her head as she realized the tables had turned. 
This is blackmail. Nope, it's business. You wanted to charge us for something we didn't owe. Now I'm charging you for something you want but don't own. The choice is yours. In the end, they paid. It wasn't about the money for me. It was about standing up to bullies and showing them that their actions have consequences. As I deposited that check, I couldn't help but smile, knowing that even though I'd moved on, I'd left a lasting impact on that community. Sometimes the best revenge is simply not letting the entitled people of the world win. As a commercial airline pilot with over 15 years of experience, I've dealt with my fair share of difficult passengers. But nothing could have prepared me for what happened on that fateful Friday afternoon flight from New York to Los Angeles. Let me back up a bit. I've always been fascinated by aviation. Ever since I was a kid, growing up near an airport, I'd spend hours watching planes take off and land, dreaming of the day I'd be in a cockpit. After high school, I joined the Air Force, where I honed my skills and gained valuable experience. When I transitioned to civilian life, becoming a commercial pilot was a natural next step. Over the years, I've flown countless routes, dealt with all kinds of weather conditions, and managed various in-flight emergencies. But the one thing that always kept me on my toes was passenger behavior. You'll be surprised at how entitled some people can be when they are 30,000 feet in the air. Anyway, back to that Friday. It was a typical summer day, hot and humid in New York. I arrived at the airport early as usual to go through my pre-flight checks and briefings. Everything was going smoothly until boarding time. As passengers started filing onto the plane, I noticed a woman and her son near the front of the line. The woman had an expensive looking camera hanging around her neck and her son, who looked about 10 years old, was practically bouncing with excitement. I didn't think much of it at first. Kids are often excited about flying, especially if it's their first time. But as they get closer to the plane's entrance, I overheard a snippet of their conversation. Remember, sweetie, mommy's going to get you those special pictures in a cockpit. You'll be the envy of all your friends. Yay! I can't wait to sit in the pilot's seat. I felt a knot forming in my stomach. As a pilot, I'm used to kids being curious about the cockpit, and sometimes we do allow brief visits before or after the flight if time permits. But this sounded like something more elaborate. Once all the passengers were seated, I started my usual pre-flight announcement. That's when there was a knock on the cockpit door. My co-pilot opened it, and there stood the woman with the camera, her son right behind her. Excuse me, we're ready for our photo shoot now. I'm sorry, what photo shoot? The one in the cockpit, of course. My son here is an aspiring pilot and I promised him a full photo session in a real airplane cockpit for his birthday. I was taken aback. This was definitely not standard procedure, and certainly not something we could accommodate, especially right before takeoff. Ma'am, I'm afraid that's not possible. The cockpit is a restricted area, and we're about to begin our pre-flight procedures. But I paid for first-class tickets. Surely that entitles us to some special treatment. I understand you paid for first class, but that doesn't grant access to the cockpit. It's a safety regulation we have to follow strictly. The woman's face turned red, and I could see she was getting angry. Do you know who I am? I'm friends with the CEO of this airline. One call from me, and you'll be out of a job. I've heard this kind of threat before, and it rarely turns out to be true. But even if it was, safety regulations are non-negotiable. I'm sorry, but my decision stands. The cockpit is off-limits. Now please return to your seat so we can prepare for takeoff. I thought that would be the end of it, but I was wrong. The woman stormed off, dragging her disappointed son behind her. I closed the cockpit door and continued with my pre-flight checks. About 10 minutes later, as we were preparing to leave the gate, there was another knock on the door. Thinking it might be one of the flight attendants with an urgent message, I opened the door. To my shock, the woman burst into the cockpit, camera in hand, was her son in tow. See, honey, I told you mommy would get you in here. Before I could react, she started snapping pictures of her son, who had plopped himself down in my seat. Ma'am, you need to leave immediately. This is a serious breach of security. Oh, stop being so dramatic. It's just a few pictures. I reached for the intercom to call for security, but the woman noticed and grabbed my arm. Don't you dare. We're not leaving until we get our photos. That's when things escalated quickly. 
As I tried to remove her hand from my arm, she suddenly lashed out, slapping me across the face. The shock of it stunned me for a moment. My co-pilot jumped in to help, trying to restrain the woman while I ushered the frightened child out of the cockpit. The commotion attracted the attention of the flight attendants and several passengers. Help! This man is assaulting me! I'm being attacked! Her shrieks echoed through the cabin, causing panic among some of the passengers. It was chaos. Fortunately, one of our flight attendants was a former police officer. He quickly took control of the situation, restraining the woman and calming the other passengers. This woman forcefully entered the cockpit and assaulted me when I tried to remove her. Don't worry, sir. I've already alerted airport security. They are on their way. The woman continued to scream and struggle as a flight attendant held her. You can't do this to me. Do you know how much these tickets cost? I demand to speak to your supervisor. Ma'am, assaulting a pilot is a federal offense. You're going to be speaking to law enforcement, not a supervisor. Within minutes, airport security arrived and escorted the woman and her son off the plane. As they left, I could hear her threatening lawsuits against everyone from me to the entire airline. The incident delayed our departure by over an hour. We had to file reports, speak with law enforcement and calm down the other passengers, some were understandably shaken by the commotion. Once everything settled down, I addressed the passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the delay and any distress this incident may have caused. I want to assure you that at no point was your safety compromised. We take security very seriously, which is why we had to respond firmly to this breach. We'll be departing shortly and our crew will do everything possible to make the rest of our journey comfortable. The rest of the flight was uneventful, thankfully, and when we landed in Los Angeles I learned that the woman had been arrested and charged with assault and interfering with a flight crew. Her son had been placed in the care of Child Protective Services until relatives could be contacted. As for the woman's claim about knowing the SEO, turns out she had once attended the same charity gala as him and had snapped a selfie. That was the extent of their friendship. In all my years of flying, I've never encountered entitlement quite like that. But I know that as long as there are planes in the sky, there will be passengers who think the rules don't apply to them. As pilots, all we can do is stay vigilant, prioritize safety, and hope that most people understand that when it comes to aviation, Following the rules isn't just polite, it's a matter of life and death. Growing up, my dad was a traffic cop, and he'd drill into my head the importance of following rules and being courteous on a road. So when someone blatantly disregards those rules, it really gets under my skin. It was supposed to be a relaxing Saturday afternoon. My wife and I decided to hit up IKEA for some new furniture. We've been saving up for months to revamp our living room and we were excited to finally make it happen. The shopping trip went well and we were heading home with a car full of flat back furniture and big smiles on our faces. That's when it happened. We were cruising along following all the traffic rules like good citizens. When suddenly this massive SUV came out of nowhere and cut right in front of us. I had to slam on a brake so hard I thought my foot would go through the floor. My wife lit at a yelp and I felt my heart racing. Did you see that? What the hell? That was close. They almost hit us. I was fuming as the SUV sped away. I noticed it had a for sale sign plastered on its rear window with a phone number scrawled on it. Hey, can you grab a quick picture of that number? Sure, got it. Why? Just in case. You never know when it might come in handy. Little did she know I was already formulating a plan. You see, I'm not the type to let things go easily, especially when it comes to reckless driving. It might seem pity to some, but I call it justice. For the next two weeks, I made it my mission to give that SUV owner a taste of their own medicine. Every workday morning at 5.30 a.m., I'd arrive at my office and make a beeline for the common area phone. I'd dial that number and ask all sorts of questions about that vehicle. Day 1. Hi. I am calling about the SUV for sale. What's the mileage on it? Oh, it's got about 57 miles. Are you interested in buying? Maybe. I'll call back with more questions. Day 2. Hello again, it's me from yesterday. What color is the interior? It's beige leather. Look, it's 5.30 in the morning. Can you call at a reasonable hour? Oh, sorry, this is the only time I'm free. I'll call back tomorrow with more questions. Day 3. Good morning. I forgot to ask yesterday. Does it have a sunroof? Caring groggily. Yes, it does. Please, can you call later in the day? I'm afraid this is the only time I can call. 
I'll ring again tomorrow. After day three, they stopped answering. But the band stopped me? Absolutely not. I kept calling, day after day leaving voicemails with increasingly bizarre questions. Day four voicemail. Hi, it's me again. I was wondering if the cup holders can fit a big gulp. Call me back. Day five voicemail. Hello, quick question. Does the SUV come with a built-in cappuccino maker? It's a deal breaker for me. Day six voicemail. Good morning. I need to know if the seats are comfortable enough for my pet giraffe. He's very particular about his ride. I kept this up for nine glorious work days. Each morning, I'd waltzed into that common area with a spring in my step, knowing that I was about to make someone's morning just a little bit worse. Was it mature? Probably not. Was it satisfying? You bet it was. My wife got on to what I was doing after a few days. She just shook her head and laughed, saying that I was impossible. But I could see the glimmer of amusement in her eyes. She knew as well as I did that some people need to learn their lessons the hard way. On the last day of my little revenge project, I decided to go out with a bang. I left one final voicemail. Hi there, I've been calling about the SUV, and I think I'm finally ready to make a decision. I've thought long and hard about it, and I've come to the conclusion that I don't want your car. You see, I prefer vehicles driven by people who respect others on the road and don't put lives at risk by cutting people off in traffic. Have a great day, and please drive safely. I never heard back from them, of course. But I like to think that maybe, just maybe, they learned something from all this. Perhaps the next time they attempted to cut someone off, they'll remember the crazy person who called him at the crack of dawn for two weeks straight and think twice. As for me, well, I learned that revenge is a dish best served cold. And early in the morning. My wife and I still laugh about it sometimes when we pass by that IKEA. And you know what? I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. I've always been the kind of person who likes to stay on top of their finances. Growing up, my parents taught me the importance of budgeting and managing money wisely. So when I landed my first real job out of college in the mid-90s, I made sure to set up a solid banking system for myself. I chose Solomon Smith Barney as my main bank because they offered their unique credit card. It wasn't your typical credit card or even a debit card. This card was special. It let you spend only what you had in your checking account but it didn't take the money out right away. Instead, I just set that money aside until the bill was due. It was perfect for someone like me who wanted the convenience of a credit card without the risk of overspending. Anyway, it was a sunny Tuesday afternoon in 1998 when I found myself in a bit of a pickle. I needed a cashier's check for $1,500 to pay the security deposit on a new apartment I was moving into. The thing is, I couldn't get to my usual Solomon Smith Barney branch because it was clear across town. And I had to get this check before the bank closed. So I decided to try my luck at a branch of my personal bank. Let's just say it rhymes with Bell's Bargo, which was much closer. I figured since I had my Solomon Smith Barney credit card, it shouldn't be a problem to get the cashier's check. I walked into the bank feeling confident and ready to get this done quickly. Customer service area was pretty quiet, was just a couple of people ahead of me in line. When it was my turn, I approached the desk with a smile. Hi there. I need a cashier's check for $1,500, please. The woman behind the desk barely looked up from her computer. She had this sour expression on her face like she'd just eaten a lemon. How will you be paying for that? I'll be using my credit card. I slid my Solomon Smith Barney card across the desk. And that's when things took a turn. You can't put a cashier's check on a credit card. Her tone was sharp, almost hostile. I was taken aback by her rudeness, but I tried to keep my cool. I understand that's usually the case, but this is a special type of credit card. It only lets me spend what I have in my account. It doesn't matter. We don't do cashier's checks with credit cards. Period. She seemed to be enjoying my discomfort, which only made me more determined to find a solution. Look, I really need this check today. Is there any way we can work this out? No. Is there anything else I can help you with? Her smug tone was the last straw. That's when an idea hit me. Actually, yes. I'd like a cash advance of $1,500 on this credit card, please. The teller's face fell. She realized what I was doing. She reluctantly pulled out the old manual credit card imprinter. You know, those chunky machines they used to use before everything went digital. She had to go through this whole process of imprinting my card. Getting the paperwork approved and then counting out 
$100 bills. As she handed me the cash, I could see the annoyance written all over her face. Will that be all? Not quite. Now I'd like a cashier's check for $1,500, please. The teller opened her mouth to refuse, then stopped short. She realized I now had the cash in hand. Her face turned an interesting shade of red as she processed what had just happened. I... fine. Give me a moment. She begrudgingly started the process of creating the cashier's check, muttering under her breath the whole time. I stood there trying not to look too pleased with myself. Once she finished, she practically shoved the check at me. Here is your check. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for your help. You've been very accommodating. I walked out of that bank feeling like I just won a small battle against the forces of bureaucracy and bank customer service. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.